Welcome everybody to the Reinvention Virtual Chat and to the Power of Reinvention podcast. My guests today are Jackie Reeses and Lauren Weinberg, and they are the authors of this incredible, incredible book. Sorry, you're going to see all these wonderful things that I've tagged in here that I want to address today. Self-Made Boss and no two better ladies than Jackie and Lauren to write a book like this. I'm going to give a little background on them. For those who don't know, I started the Reinvention Virtual Chats because I launched my book on March 7th, the week before we were told to go home at the beginning of the pandemic. So I had to reinvent my own marketing plan for my book, which is Reinvent Your Life. What are you waiting for? That was fun and was a true testament. I think I can write the playbook now on reinventing when it comes to a book launch plan. But out of that came the virtual chat, the podcast, and here we still are two years later. And I thank you all for those of you who are here on a regular basis. For those who are here for the first time, thank you for being a part of the conversation. We're here to inspire, to motivate, and to explore conversations that help us all live a much better life than we may be living or explore different ways to live our life in ways that we never thought were possible. So I'm thrilled and excited that this is where we're at. Um, I want to give a little background on Jackie and Lauren. Jackie is the CEO of Luna Financial Group, a fintech building banking related financial infrastructure for tech and crypto companies, and the chair of the Economic Advisory Council of the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco. She's been named one of Forbes self-made women, Fast Company's most creative people in business, and American Banker's most powerful women in finance. She's held leadership positions at Yahoo and was a partner at Apex Partners worldwide, one of the largest private equity firms in the world. She also serves on the board of directors of Endeavor, a firm, and Nubank. And as for Lauren, Lauren Weinberg is the CMO of Square, where she leads global marketing and communications for the $100 billion company that provides business solutions for millions of small business owners all over the world. She's been named on Forbes CMO Next, Brand Innovators Top Women in Marketing, and FinTech's fintech hubs 30 most influential fintech marketers she has held leadership roles at yahoo mtv and aol she's an adweek executive mentor and advises early stage startups wow I mean, who better to write a book called Self-Made Bosses? And I have to say, at the beginning of every virtual chat, I read an excerpt from my book. And I was really tempted to just start with an excerpt from your book instead. But then I realized I had something that was such a great excerpt to read and a great segue into this conversation. So I'm going to take one quick moment and share just a section from Chapter 3, which is called Hello, are you still in there? And I think it's just such a great introduction to everything that you're doing because then you take that deeper dive for all of those who want to be entrepreneurs, who want to delve into something deeper and take all of those steps that it takes. So this particular segment of the chapter is called Feed Your Soul. When we let our dreams go, we let part of ourselves go with them. We get grumpy, we get angry and resentful. We start to assume things will never work out for us. We have an empty spot in our hearts that never fills full, no matter what we do. The little rock star grew up. He went on to school. He got a job. He started a family. The guitar he played as a teenager gathered dust in the same garage he used to practice in until eventually it was sold or stashed in the attic figuratively and literally. So here you are 25 years later, the lawyer, developer, marketer, caretaker, chained to your desk, your life duties, commitments, financial responsibilities, and perhaps your childhood dreams. I ask you this, when was the last time you picked up a guitar? How would you feel if you bought yourself a new one, took lessons on YouTube, or formed a garage band with your buddies who feel the same way? It's okay to nurture your decadent, ridiculous, childish whims. Hello, are you still in there? Maybe you won't become the next Eddie Van Halen, but what about taking a few lessons? Sound ridiculous? Fabulous. It should be. It will nurture your soul in a way you can't imagine and clearly haven't dared to dream of doing. 
Perhaps when you go to work on Monday, you'll have a skip in your step or a smile on your face that just wasn't there before. The goal here is to create balance, dig deep, and tap into the things that give you a sense of accomplishment, satisfaction, and stimulation. Find activities that simply make you happy while getting back in touch with your true self. So as I've delved into all this incredible content and subject matter that you've been dealt, that you've covered, Jackie and Lauren, I just thought, what an amazing place to start the conversation. Here you are encouraging people how to be entrepreneurs, how to be their own boss. We've gone through two incredibly crazy years where people have really questioned what they're doing with their lives. And I'm so excited to address all of this with you and delve into this conversation. So I haven't even given you a chance to really say hello. So hi, thank you. Hello, for being thanks here. for having us. I appreciate it, it. It's the best. It's the best. Yes, thank you, Kathy. So your book, um, I, j- I just want to share a little about your book, and I'm going to ask each of you to sort of give your perspective on why you created this book, why you wrote it where and how your life experiences really lent to it. But this book is really full of tools and advice for helping people in small businesses start, run, and grow a business. And I always have this this expression that I love to say to people, just because you make a fabulous meatball does not mean you should run a restaurant. And I'm now going to start adding to it, unless you have read self-made boss, because <laughs> then you have the total guidebook of how to really build a business. So Jackie, maybe we can start with you. And I want to kind of go back a little bit and ask you, when you were young and growing up, did you have any sense of what you wanted to be doing with your life? If you reinvented over and over again, you've had a lot of pivots, a lot of turns, but what sort of got you to where you are today? Um, I think the the theme that I would draw upon um, most consistent, consistently is driven into two categories. One, I grew up in a very entrepreneurial family. So I grew up behind the counter of a retail pharmacy and I worked on holidays at all hours with my both parents. And I witnessed kind of what hard work was at a very gritty entrepreneurial level. And so I too had my own business when I was 16 years old. Um, And so I think that experience as a child kind of made me who I am and drove me to be consistently aggressive in the way that I pursue business. And then the second theme was that around having to be independent and have my own life. So I had left my house when I was 14. and had to kind of make it on my own. And so the benefit of having to do that was um, a very entrepreneurial mindset from a different approach and vector of my life. And so I was able to combine those really formative experiences with an amazing education and an amazing experience at the start of my career at Goldman Sachs Mm. in order to at least set like a a mental foundation. And I think mental is frankly where most of the battle is. Ignore anything on my resume. It's how you approach your job and what you wanna do and how you really figure out what your spikes are that really makes who you're going to be in your professional life. And so I think those were probably the most important things rather than saying, oh, I wanted to be a banker or a, you know, anything else. Um, That's quite insightful. It's a lot of wisdom to have at that point in your life um, and must have been really a driving force that helped you sort of shape where you were going. Absolutely. Um, yeah. And how about for you, Lauren? What what was sort of the early, early markers for you of where you might end up in life? I mean, some of us grow up going, I'm going to be a ballerina or a lift, a lift operator. You know, we, we just don't know where it's going to take us. Some of us start a lemonade, lemonade stand business at five and we've got that, you know, entrepreneurial drive. So what was it for you? Where, what was your trajectory? So I would say for me, I think initially I really like love animals. Anyone that knows me can attest to that. And I thought for a while, maybe I'll be a vet, but then I realized very early on that I'm incredibly squeamish. So everything in the medical (laughs) arena is like out for me. And in college, 
I thought I wanted to be a journalist and I was in a journalism program and I worked at CNN and I worked at the Atlanta Journal Constitution and I worked at Jezebel Magazine. I did all these things only to discover that I didn't want to be a journalist. And so I would say my journey has been unexpected and fun and the way that I've approached it has been just like getting into things that are interesting to me and then finding the things that are like right nearby and saying that seems interesting too and just I think similar to Jackie being I would say persistent about it and saying hey I think I could do that thing over there can I have that opportunity but not necessarily really knowing where I wanted to go and so I think people ask me that question all the time when yeah. did you know you wanted to be a CMO I'm like I don't know maybe like eight years ago um, not that long ago, I think other people sort of have these like grand aspirations for what they want to do. And just quite honestly, that wasn't me. Um, mine was a very happy accidental journey into things that were interesting and tangential along the way. Yeah. And I think that's an interesting point. You know, some of us don't wake up and say, oh, I want to be an entrepreneur. We actually just evolve into it because we have a passion for something or we want to build something and you know we want to create a successful business we maybe don't want to work for other people so therefore we become entrepreneurs but i think it's a very interesting statement i mean i've been running my own company for over 30 years now i have been a lifetime serial entrepreneur but with one company but with all the different clients and projects i work on i feel like there is a constant state of reinvention in my life because I'm learning new things. I'm engaging in new topics. I'm meeting and, and working with so many different subject matters and people. And, you know, it's given me a wonderful platform to build and create more and more of that and also guide and advise people because of the experiences there. So when you both decided that it was, firstly, you know, where and how did you both connect? And was it at Square, given the background that I know you both have? Was it somewhere else that brought you together? What was, what was that moment, Jackie? Well, we met at Yahoo. We were both senior executives ah, yes. at Yahoo. Um, and we were very lucky to work there. It was a really special place with an amazing diaspora of people who have gone on to do really interesting things post their experience at Yahoo. And then um, I went to Square and Lauren came and joined us when we needed a CMO. Um, there was no one we wanted more than Lauren um, yeah. in that role. And so we got very lucky. Yeah. Um, and so <clears throat> I think the shared passion makes it easy um, to make a jump like that, where we both had experiences with small business and wanted to support the theme. You can't work in a company with the hours and energy that we do without having a passion for it and an appreciation for it at your core. Yeah. Makes a lot of sense. And I think, and if I'm not mistaken, Lauren, you know, Square actually is a tool and such an important inflection point for a lot of companies with new businesses that are building companies trying to figure out how to reach and market more people with their businesses and what have you. So I, it sort of feels like you're getting the best of both worlds as far as dealing with entrepreneurs and helping them solve problems, but also as the CMO of Square doing your job every day in building and growing the business. And so what's that like for you? Because it feels like there's probably a really interesting intersection of a lot of expertise on both sides of that conversation where you are, right? Yeah. And I would say, I mean, at Square, it's very much the philosophy, like as a business, we're successful when our entrepreneurs are successful. And so everything we do at Square is really rooted in this shared purpose around breaking down barriers, creating accessibility, giving tools to small business owners that potentially were not available to them before. I think, you know, Jackie can talk a lot about this, but access to capital, marketing and email communication tools, the ability to run payroll right from your point of sale. So a lot of what we do at Square is really around taking tools that would have been traditionally available to larger businesses and giving them to smaller businesses Amazing. so that they could be successful and sort of leveling the playing field. So it is, and a lot of what I do in my job is talking to 
small business owners and always trying to just like have a lot of empathy. I mean, I also ran my own business before I went to Square. So right. I have a lot of empathy for all of the challenges that come along with running your own business. And I would say that's definitely like a big part of, I think what Jackie did when she was at Square and what I do there now is just right. talking to merchants and business owners and understanding like, what are their pain points? What are their struggles? And, and that's really how the idea for this book was really born. Right. Well, perfect segue. So I do want to talk about that um, as an entrepreneur for 30 plus years. And frankly, I'm going to have to circle back with the both of you because I'm in the midst of launching a new company around the luxury lifestyle for pets and their owners. And we're going to need to have a lot of conversations with you about what we're doing. So definitely have to come back to that. But uh, what was the moment where you realized that the wealth of knowledge that you both had, and Jackie, I do want to touch on, you know, the financial piece of this, because at the crux of every great idea is the necessity to find the money, the capital, to understand budgets, to understand long-term and short-term planning, and that is so much in your wheelhouse. So how does somebody who has absolutely, you know, that person that makes a great meatball or wants to create a restaurant or, and you've got incredible examples in your book and stories. I mean, I've marked all these great stories, but I'll let you maybe share some from your perspective that really exemplify that journey that one goes on and those kind of hurdles that they have to overcome. You know, there, we start with uh, a chapter that talks about um, getting started, writing a business plan, and then um, taking the, the chapter is taking the first step. And I would say there are two dimensions to it. One, which is kind of mental and philosophical, and the other, which is practical. So yeah. the mental and philosophical is, are you ready? Do you have the support network? Because uh, when you're going and starting a very small business, right. um, it's often a pretty lonely venture where you're out on your own and you're really putting yourself out there um, uh, in a way that is very personal because it's your expertise, it's your brain, it's your brand. Sometimes it's even tied to yourself financially. And so you need to have the buy-in of your family that you want to do it. So yeah. The last thing you want to be battling is, is someone who you need to turn to when things aren't going so well and things will not go well all the time. <laughs> well said. <laughs> the second component of that is that you have to be able to deal with the pragmatics. So have you estimated the amount of money you need in order to get to revenue and cash flow positive? Because you need to make sure you have the financials lined up in order to put yourself in a position that you're not at risk personally, or you're not making short-term decisions, which are illogical or not helpful because you don't have the capacity to finance the business. And so we give some guidelines for how mm -hmm. to save up enough money to make sure that you've got the financing in place. Yep. Um, and then later we talk about how do you raise uh, debt capital? Um, yes. We don't go through equity capital in this book. That in and of itself could be you know, that's, that's the next book, <laughs> venture capital based right. businesses. But if you're trying to raise a loan for a small business, we certainly go through that in a lot of detail as well. Yeah. And I love that you talk about in this business plan chapter, you talk about asking for help. And I think that's a really important point. I really flag that because I think many people who have the confidence to do something fabulous and special may be a little reticent to ask for help. And there are so many places to go to help for help. It might be the SBA loan, you know, people, it might be friends and mentors, like the entire gamut of what you share in here, where it may seem obvious, but if people don't recognize the value of that. You also talk about taking it on the road and testing it. Oh my goodness. I mean, if I had a dime for every person that should do that and didn't do that in this journey. And I think, you know, from a marketing standpoint, and Lauren, this, uh, you know, sort of a question for you, and we are both marketers. We, we kind of really think from this point of view, there are so many things that you need to do before you start marketing and telling the world about your product, right? So that taking it on the road, that testing it, where and how do you see that fitting into 
the marketing equation. You know, there are a lot of assumptions that one makes and the world has changed dramatically and our algorithms and social media that we're all relying on to launch campaigns and products and ideas and do things. It's very, very interesting space that keeps evolving. What's your perspective there? Yeah, I would say on that, I think that like taking on the road, getting that feedback is really, I mean, ideally when you're creating your business or your services or whatever that is, you have a specific audience and a need that you're solving in mind. To me, the idea of like taking your idea on the road is sort of pressure testing and getting that feedback. And I think when it comes to marketing, it really all boils down to like, who is your audience and why does this matter for them? And so those two things are very connected. So a, I think as an entrepreneur, you know, you have very limited time in the day. You wear every single hat in your business. And so yeah. marketing can't take up all of your time, which means you're probably not creating a presence on every single platform, maybe out of the gate. So in that phase of sort of pressure testing and taking your concepts on the road, I think is a great time to be understanding more about who's your audience. Where do they spend time? What do they care about? And that way, when you're developing your marketing plan, you know where to find the people that are, you know, you're really designing your products or your business for, you know what they care about. And that's yeah. kind of like step number one in marketing, right? Be where your audience is and communicate something that's valuable to them. So yep. those two points are very connected, I think, for yep. small business owners and skipping that step of really understanding. And we talk about this in the book too, I think can be quite a misstep for people. You assume right. your products and services are for one audience only to find out that they're for another. And so if you've tailored your brand, your positioning, your marketing and everything for what you thought without really understanding that, that obviously yeah. is a lot of time to go back and rework that. Right. And, I, and so no, Lauren ahead. has this great suggestion for how to do marketing which okay. is totally worth talking through. I found it fascinating and learned a okay. lot from it. Lauren, you should talk about it. It's great. Anyone can use this if you run a business. Love this. There's just a couple of tips that we give on terms of like how to break it down. Because I think one of the biggest questions that I get asked is yeah. how often should I do marketing and do I need to be on every platform? And so the answer to that question is definitely you don't need to be on every platform. I think that's something that can come with time. So again, it starts with understanding your audience. And I think to be honest, like what we suggest is actually just to like break it down into like a content calendar, right? And one of the things I think that people find, and hopefully, Kathy, as you read this book that you found interesting yep. are the backstories oh, of the stories were incredible, and incredible, and priceless. So, right. And so one of the things I think that we're like suggesting to business owners is actually like you can use these social channels to really share your backstory. And maybe you share a little bit every week. And then that's one post that you can take care of a week. So if you're going to shoot for having three posts a week, one can be kind of just like why you're in business, who you are, how you got to be where you are, what makes your products or services different and special. The other thing could be like about your products and services or potentially promotions. And another could be about your employees. And I think if you just can kind of break it down and you have this three times a week, I'm going to do these things. Even if you think about your busiest time, if you yeah. know you have that plan, I think that makes it feel a lot more like, Tangible less overwhelming and, and less overwhelming. <laughs> right. for sure. And then a lot of it is also like, what's your business? And I think that's a good indication of what platforms you should be on. So if you have a food business, right? Instagram, very visual platform. Good to be on there. If you are a personal trainer and you're doing a lot of videos like TikTok and also Instagram, great platforms to be on. So if you are a writer, probably you want to be more on Facebook and so yeah. Twitter, right? And so I think it's really thinking about like your audience, your products and solutions, the channel that you want to be on, and then just breaking down your plan into something that's like really, I think, practical. And that way, even in your busiest times, because yeah. something always goes wrong when you run a business. That's just yeah. like the inevitability of it, yeah. that you know what you're going to do. And then it's something that takes you five minutes as opposed to sitting down in front of your screen and just feeling paralyzed. Oh my God, what am I Where do? should I go? What right. should I say? I right. don't know which platform to be on. I don't know how to post. And it takes time. 
too. Yeah. I think that's the other thing. Yeah. You don't build a following overnight. You're going to post some content that's a bust and that's fine, right? It's like the more you do it, the better you get and the more audience you'll build. Yeah, and you know, one other thing I'll add to that, if I may, is um, when you also share editorials about trends in the business space that you're involved in and sharing other people's editorial stories, commenting on them, you know, giving props to someone and commentary around it is also a wonderful type of post to put into that sort of rotation, because it does also help expand your audience. You're tapping into the author of that story, as well as their audience. And so that might also be another component of that sort of three, three stool, three legged stool, maybe it's a four legged stool. And that's another one to sort of add to that rotation. It also gives you a chance to be a thought leader in the space and to comment and edit on, you know, other people's stories and what is being said in the industry. So I think that's also another good piece to add to that. And it sounds like we both deal with this a lot and it's, it's an important and it's an ever changing and very challenging space. So I don't think any of us can ever hear it enough or learn from it enough and try a lot of different things, but you're so right. The ability to just be organized and sort of a little strategic in your, within the context of your life to be able to manage that piece is so important and has huge payoffs and dividends if you do it you know, consistently. Um, that being said, and we touched on sort of the stress of it all, what about the stress of it all? You know, there, there's sort of this issue of mindfulness, right, that has come up in all of our lives. And how do we balance this love and passion for wanting to have our own thing, but not running around with our hair on fire saying, wow, I'm just a stress case 24 seven because it's my business and I own it and I go to sleep thinking about it and I wake up thinking about it. And all of a sudden we're sort of trying to balance, do I really love what I'm doing? <laughs> Was I crazy? So you've had so many incredible people that you've both worked with, advised, consulted, stories in the book that you tell. Are there any other good examples? And Jackie, maybe, you know, you've had some, especially I think money completely freaks most people out, especially if it's not really the area of expertise. So how, how do you advise that people manage and deal with some of that? So on mindfulness um, or stress, I guess um, when you start your own business, you're guaranteed to be stressed out. It just is. Um because you're wearing what you do on your sleeve. Um, right. And it's an incredible challenge. Um, right. And if it's not, you're probably not pushing hard enough. Um, and I think the managing mindfulness, it might not be something you think you have to pay attention to until the point at which it becomes counterproductive for the growth and success of your business. And so one example of, of how that might manifest itself is you haven't taken a vacation for that long. You're burnt out. You start barking at some of your customers. Yeah. And so there are these moments in time where you have to think, do I need to hire someone to do a job that I might not be best suited to do? Do I need to hire someone to take a job because I need the time back either personally or because mm. I need to apply it to something that is a much deeper level of expertise and I think paying attention to those signals is super important because it's not just meant to be a um, soft issue that has a theoretical impact on your overall well-being. It had it it can translate into actual execution mistakes, and yeah. so I do think it's important to pay attention to um, as you think about employees, company culture. Um, and what you're implying with the way that you run your company and also your own, your own health. Um, and so I, you know, I, I think we're paying attention to it more now than ever. Yeah. Um, we do reference mindfulness in the book. We interviewed, uh, someone from Google who is a specialist in mindfulness and we interview, uh, a, um, executive coach who talks about how they coach CEOs, Right. To be better leaders. And so some of that feedback, super helpful in the book. 
Yeah, no, I love that. And I think, look, it's a, you bring up a really good point. We're dealing with it more than ever right now. And it really interesting environments in the workspace. We've been talking a lot lately about corporate culture and hybrid environments and returning to work and the stress that that is putting on people when they've sort of created a new norm for themselves and managed how they're juggling kids and school and family and elderly parents and all the other things that are reality of life in this last two years has given everybody a chance to reevaluate how they want to actually live and do all of that. And the good news there is we've had a chance to really look at the other side of it. The bad news is now everybody's really confused personally about what they want, but also corporations are confused about what they need for productivity, what they're obligated to do, how to be respectful and sensitive and create a corporate culture that actually acknowledges all of that. So, you know, I'm sure you're both experiencing it from different sides of the coin. I'd love to hear just a little bit of your perspective on this, because it is one of the most important and I think very significantly talked about topics of the moment in the corporate world. So what are your thoughts there? And Lauren, I'd love you to weigh on that as well. Yeah. I mean, I'm happy to start. I think, yep. I think it's, it's interesting because if you asked a business owner today, what one of their top challenges are definitely staffing is a big one. And I think there is a lot more intentionality on where people work and spend their time. It's why we just had this like great resignation where people are sort of shifting. And for a lot of people, they'd rather start their own thing. And yep. and to Jackie's point, it's definitely not easy, but it's their own. And then I would say, I think the challenge from a small business perspective is that business owners now need to think about things that usually were sort of off limits and things that big companies thought about like culture and benefits and what are the things that they're going to do to draw people into their business including like what do they stand for what kind of employees do they hire what are they going to offer to people and i think that that's kind of just introducing like a whole new host of challenges for small business owners because offering benefits to employees when you run your own business is a really costly endeavor, but it's really important. And I think a lot of people want to do it. And we talked to some really amazing business owners in the book who, who talked about just little things. So there's Keith Miller who runs Bubbly Paws and he talks about providing like floor mats for his dog groomers to stand on so that their feet don't hurt at the end of the day. And to be honest, like it's those things, it's those little details. Yeah. It's about really like, caring about your people. And yep. I think for about people to be able to see other people that look like them, because yep. for, for many small businesses, for some people can work remotely, but if you own a store or a dog grooming location, or you're a hairstylist, like you have to go into work. And I think getting people to go in now needs to come with these additional benefits, or there's just a lot of options for people right now. And so they're not going to yeah. want to engage. And then I would say on the square side, we're like a work from remote for forever company for now. And so wow. that I, I would say for us, like we've been fortunate in that regard, we're trying to get people together and it's really enjoyable, but we're not forcing it at the moment. And right. I think a lot of people, including myself, really enjoy the flexibility of being able to work from home, but I also love getting to see people and there's a great yeah. energy there. So I think it really is about finding the right balance yeah. um, and for larger businesses to really think about like what they give up by forcing people to come into the office and what they achieve from that. Um, and I, I think it's, it's hard. I think that there's definitely a lot to be gained by being in person with your peers. I think it's just yeah. a of like, how much do you want to mandate it? Right, exactly. And I think, look, it's interesting. I've got an amazing team here. And when it was time to start coming back and bring in new people, I asked everybody, what would you like to do? And fortunately, because I'm a big fan of all being together, I think there's incredible creativity and productivity. And again, it depends on the business that you're in. Um, and everybody wanted to be in the office as much as they could. And they, they appreciate the energy and, and just all that comes with that and the synergy, um, which is really exciting. Um, another question that I have, and Jackie, maybe this is um, directed for you at the moment, which is um, when you're, how do you really know when you need to scale and grow a new business. And, you know, you sort of like get on this trajectory, things are going well, you're sticking to your budget, 
all of a sudden you realize you may be growing faster than you, you know, expected. Maybe you're not, but how do you, how do you know like what that right time is? And, and, you know, this risk of course, with everything that we're doing and in, in new being a new business owner, but from going from a passion project into a real business, you know, what, what are some of the markers there that you think people really have to be aware of? Yeah. <clears throat> First I'd say, it's really interesting because um, there are 30 million small businesses in the United States, 23 million of them are sole proprietors. And so there's a huge portion of businesses that are choosing to stay small, where it is a lifestyle for themselves that they want to pursue. And so those dynamics are great if you want to keep doing the work that you're doing and that's what you enjoy, or you're the only one who could do it and you just want to do your craft. Um And then sometimes people just don't want to deal with the problems of a bigger business. Um, Mm -hmm. And they much prefer to just keep it small, keep it exclusive, keep it to manage their lifestyle. And so that's okay if that's your choice. But if you decide that you want to scale, um, there's lots of ways you can go do that. Um, First, by thinking of who you might need to go hire. To do that, there are a Mm -hmm. lot of reasons why you might hire someone, either because you don't have the skill, you don't have the time, um, you need um, to multiply your expertise. And so we provide a framework for like, how do you know when to hire and when to hire full-time versus part-time? And then there are a lot of dimensions that you can pursue around different product lines, different business expansion opportunities, international expansion opportunities. So you can think through frameworks of like, how do you want to grow your revenue if that's what you're looking to do? Um, And so we walk through that a lot in the book to try to make it easy for someone to understand if these are the sets of questions you're thinking about around how to grow your revenue, you might consider putting yourself in this mentality of fast growth and then kind of putting your foot on the accelerator, both with employees as well as new business options to pursue. Yeah, no, that's great. And it's so interesting. I mean, look, I think some people look at this opportunity to reinvent some part of their lives, especially again, with all that we've gone through in the last few years, it's brought up a lot of opportunities or questions for so many, but a reinvention doesn't have to happen in five minutes. I mean, there are those, and there are little things we can do to tweak some part of our life and it's an aha moment and it just kind of changes everything. And there are 10 year plans. And I think as you're, you know, sort of discussing this, when is the right time and what is the right strategy? If you don't have to be in a hurry (laughs) to build this company for some reason, or you're meeting some need that just really needs that immediate attention, it is really important, right? To be able to pace yourself and make sure you're doing it right. You know, usually cash flow is the issue. Mm -hmm. Um, And cash flow is really different than revenue. Um, And so you can even think of like the vendors that you use and work with around your home. Like if you have a gardener and they bill you on a monthly basis, and then it takes you three weeks to pay them. Like, just think of that cash flow dynamic and how negative that is for the gardener versus taking an immediate payment. And so oftentimes people, if they want to expand, they have to think about how to buy inventory capital or even how to buy, how to invest in working capital themselves so that they could go build their business. And that's not always available at the smallest companies. You know, often if you walk into a traditional bank, the smallest loan they'll want to issue is a hundred thousand dollars, excuse me, or many even $250,000. And if you think about what that implies, it implies a multi-million dollar revenue business for that size loan. And so if you're a coffee shop, a beauty shop, a nail salon, an e-commerce business at home, you know, you need a $5,000 line of credit in order to grow, in order to get inventory, you don't need the 250,000. It's a great point. And so getting access to that type of capital can be critical in order to help change the trajectory from being a micro business that's more of a lifestyle business to being one where you can really push the envelope on growth. Yeah. You do realize that you're making everybody that is going to listen to this want to get you on the phone and say, how, how do I, how do I get a piece of your mind and your brains? And you have so much wisdom, but I have to tell you, and I I'm sort of holding it up for those who are only hearing this and not seeing this, but 
Self-Made Boss, this book is incredible. The stories, and I love that you have incredible stories of real people. Um, in my book, I do the same thing. I feel like if you can see that someone else has gone through that journey and it's so relatable, they feel like they can, you know, that like, that's me. That's a real person. That's not just looking at someone successful going, how on earth did they get there? And so I love that you do that, but there was so much practical, practical information and advice in here. And we're putting the links in the chats and we're going to be putting them in the po- in the show notes for the podcast. Um, I have to ask you both though, and um, Lauren, maybe I'll start with you on this, but there must have been some incredible mentors and people in your life along the way that sort of have helped you either get to where you are or that you've looked at and said, I really, you know, I emulate what that, that one individual or two few people are doing. So in that context, if you were to have a dinner party and you could have people around you that have really inspired you, who might that be at your table? Three or four people, and they could be alive. They could no longer be with us, but is there anybody that you would, would want to surround yourself with? Well, I would say, even though I talk to Jackie all the time, <laughs> she definitely would get an invite to my dinner I love party. That. Um, Jackie is definitely somebody that has probably been my biggest cheerleader. And like, I always look to you for advice. And I think when Jackie and I met at Yahoo, it was just really fun. We shared some like common ground. We were both New Yorkers moving to California with our families. We had like some places at the Jersey shore that we both really loved. And so it was like a really great connection. So definitely Jackie, um, I would say I've been really lucky in my life to have amazing mentors that have really helped me along the way. I think Lisa Licht, Kathy, yes. a friend that we, we were share. texting this morning. She's like, I just saw who's going to be on your chat. Yeah. I was like, we were she's, talking about you. <laughs> she's another one for yeah. sure. Yeah. I think meeting Lisa, there's so much that I have in common with her and she's a little bit older than me. And I just really always admired how she balanced family and her career. Yeah. And, and she's time. also featured in my book. So her story is okay, in great. as well. Um, yeah. And so Lisa is one person. I mean, I'd have to say like, I would definitely would like Ruth Bader Ginsburg to be yeah. at the table as well. And I yeah. would love to talk to her about some of the things that are going on in the world. Um, yeah. I would say my mom, my mom is somebody that always worked and um, inspired me to just be independent and also like number one fan for sure in my life is definitely my mom. She listens to all the podcasts. She responds to all of my tweets. Um, and so I definitely would want my mom there too. Amazing. And how about you, Jackie? Is the question who would we want to have dinner with? Was that the question? It's kind of a two-part a question. Mentor. It's kind of, it's kind of a bit of both because you okay. could have mentors in your yeah. life, but then, you know, the fantasy, like, you know, some people want like the Dalai Lama at their dinner table and doesn't mean <laughs> he's a mentor per se. <laughs> I will totally entertain this crowd um, and go in a very different direction. <laughs> I love it. So there are two people that I've actually drawn learnings on with recent pop culture references. Okay. One is Harry Styles. The wow. other, Johnny Depp. I told you ah. I was to entertain you. <laughs> I love so that. Here are my learnings from each. Okay. okay. I'll do Johnny Depp's learnings first, just because it's so damn topical. So, so yeah, um, so relevant. So um, here's my learning from watching that trial or pieces of that trial and just observing, kind of yeah. having grown up um, with him as a celebrity. Yeah. That there are, there are consistencies that you watch in someone's life yeah. around how they behave with integrity, yeah. that the consistencies over an extended period of time have made a difference in the way that people reference him as a persona. Mm-hmm. And I am amazed at the consistencies. He's 58 or nine that you could draw upon 40 years of experience to understand who a person is. And I think there's a lot to be learned from that because you see it in the way he will approach someone who has zero power and might be the absence of power versus the most powerful. And I think there's there's an integrity and humility in the way that those Mm -hmm. people are approached. And so I drew upon that experience actually as a learning to kind of not forget um, how you have a legacy and a life and a consistency in the way you behave. 
yeah. no matter what you do and where you move in your career, um, you know, everyone kind of matters and those, those themes will matter and they'll yeah. draw out, you know, 50 years from now. So that's my learning from the Johnny Depp trial. Um, yeah. and, and like what I saw from that was like the kindness, the generosity, the humor, um, mm -hmm. the graciousness with people who are far less powerful is yeah. kind of where I draw that. Um, and then with Harry Styles, I'm fascinated with the way he runs his business. Fascinated because I think he is professional beyond his years in the way that he's so consistent in pushing his brand yeah. and building his brand um, with A plus quality. And it doesn't matter <laughs> whether it's consumer products, the way he approaches um, fans, buyers of his buyers of his music. Yeah. Um, there is such a profound level of professionalism and grace, um, and playfulness at the same time. Yeah. That well, is precious. Yeah, I, I wasn't going to comment on, on what he does, but more yeah. how he does it. Yeah. That I think he is an extreme brand builder in success that we should all draw some lessons on. Interesting. And, you know, in any multi omni channel, yeah. you know, music, publishing, consumer products, social media. Yeah. yeah. It's beyond impressive yeah. and also innovative. And I, you know, I, I, I think um, both, you know, I'm not a pop culture person. Both are, um, both are kind of fascinating in the way that they've been able to transcend pop culture with their business and brands. Yeah. It's fascinating. I love that. Love that. Thank I you. I thought I'd entertain with. I know. It's great. <laughs> that is great. Well, now based on that, we're getting down to the wire. I'm going to, for our podcast audience, I'm just going to sign off and say, thank you all so much for joining us. We are going to go into a little Q&A with our audience that's here in a moment. I just want to thank those who are here on the podcast for tuning in. Um, please check the show notes. There is access to reach Jackie and Lauren and information about their book, Self-Made Boss. And I thank you for joining us. So you have a wonderful day and happy reinventing. And for those who are still here, I would love to open the floor up to some questions. We have about you know, almost 10 minutes. So if anybody would like to raise their hand or unmute their mic, I will call on you and um, give you a chance to address questions. So please do. Jennifer, is that unmuted for a reason? Yes. I, I thought it might be. Hello, I knew hello. you would love being here today. So great to have you here. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. This was really great. Um, Jackie and Lauren, it's great to meet you. My name is Jennifer Schoenberger. I'm actually a reporter with Yahoo Finance. So I know oh, awesome. Yahoo has been, yeah. And, and I used to cover the Fed at Fox Business. So the Fed connection there. Um, I'm curious how entrepreneurs could use crypto to grow their business. Is there an alternative capital raise strategy there? I know it's very frontier right now, but I have to wonder if you're trying to be really scrappy right now and get ahead of the curve, um, you know, is that a strategy that can be intertwined at all? Um, both Jackie and Lauren, I'd love to hear your perspectives. I can start. Um, I think right now the, you, the biggest use case for crypto is speculation still um, in turn, like, it's used for investing more than it is for a payment or tender type. Um, and so it's still evolving and hasn't really found its place. Even, you know, the exception might be El Salvador, where they've adopted Bitcoin as an actual official currency of the government in El Salvador. And, you know, it is in process to see more governments try to deploy that strategy as well. I think there were 40 governments that met in El Salvador two weeks ago to kind of learn from that experience, but there's st <coughs> still fairly limited use cases. I think where it is being deployed is more as um, an interesting angle and kind of creative invention as a customer acquisition vehicle. Like do you want a credit card that has crypto rewards 
or do you want an account that is crypto rewards? And it's really right now still being used as a creative marketing device more than it is an actual uh, payment device with intention. Um, and so I think there's still a long way to go on that, but there are enough companies investing in the market that hopefully we'll see some interesting use cases evolve over the next few years. Thank yeah, you. I uh, would agree with Jackie. And the only thing I would add is that I do think that there's probably a place for blockchain technology in really enabling entrepreneurs. And so I think like there's there's a lot of, uh, you know, I, I agree with what Jackie's saying on cryptocurrencies and there's also like NFTs, but I do believe that like being able to leverage blockchain technology is probably something that will benefit entrepreneurs and hopefully over time with like smart contracts, help people like save time and avoid intermediaries. I still think we're like fairly nascent on that side too, but that would be, I think that's probably where we'll start to see like more regulated and more regular use potentially in the future. And yeah. Lauren, do you think Square would kind of get in that? Cause that's kind of your niche to some degree. I feel like eventually that would be a good opportunity for you guys, no? Maybe, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. Thanks. Thanks, Jennifer, appreciate it. Um, anybody else, Marvin, yes, go for it. Sorry, and then uh, Sujanya, is that correct? Okay, one moment, we'll do Marvin and then Sujanya, thank you. So Lauren, Jackie, congratulations on all your success and um, what a great topic. When I saw this, <clears throat> I had the pleasure and the honor and the opportunity to actually meet with Kathy in person. <clears throat> and for those of you that know her calendar, believe me, that's a hoop jumper that you have no idea how big that <laughs> ring is to jump. So <clears throat> one of the things that I was going to talk to her about, but we didn't have time, is actually a question that when I said, boy, if she would only have like female entrepreneurs on the show that would talk about building a business and funding, and sure enough, as the universe does, it finds what you're looking for. So yeah. uh, my question is, um, my business partner, who's female, and the publisher of my book, she uh, and she's been on Kathy's show, Andrea Albright. Um, she now has secured funding for an opportunity to grow the business, and she did a little more homework and realized that Bloomberg created an article that said a little less than three percent of all the funding went to female entrepreneurs, which I thought was fascinating because there's so many dynamic and creative and intuitive entrepreneurs in the female space that I know a lot of us know. And I'd be curious to hear what your take is and why you think this is true and how this will change. So um, I think there's a difference between venture capital funding and businesses, you know, numbers of female and underrepresented minorities that actually own businesses in the US. I think they're very different yeah. universes even though there is a Venn diagram of overlap. In venture funding, it is in fact true that it's a very small number. Um, and I think the barriers are those around relationships and credibility for fundraising. Um, meaning you don't know the right people to call, you don't have the right friend network, it's harder to get access to the venture community in order to raise money and so you're just a step removed from those kinds of insider relationships that could get you to the right firm who has the right interest at the right time. Um, there's also a, you know, a credibility and perception issue around financing, which is, you know, what job were you in? How are you perceived? You know, what's just like the fundamental feedback that you get as a leader. And I think to that front, I think female entrepreneurs, the experience around them is still evolving and there's still just kind of fundamental barriers that are being broken down around what those entrepreneurs look like, sound like, have the experience base to, to exist. Um, there's entities like Allraise that have been working to try to change those dynamics. They run a lot of workshops for female entrepreneurs so that they could train to try to eliminate some of these tells that, that confront people when they're faced with barriers around like, oh, well, you ran sales, not engineering. Or, you know, and mm -hmm. and um, so there's a bunch of different dynamics like that that still exist. But I'm pretty optimistic that 
with success will beget more success. And so you have a lot of great entrepreneurs that have made it to public markets. Um, and so I, I do think it'll ebb and flow, but we will see the numbers change ultimately um, uh, as some of these institutions and some of the women who are getting trained now kind of come up in their career and are ready to go start their own their yeah. own venture. And it's such an interesting time for that because I think we're just seeing so many more leaning in. There's more conversation, there's more confidence. So it's enabling a lot more people to feel like maybe this is in fact the time, not this very moment, but just generally speaking, which is really exciting, really exciting. I mean, it's nowhere close to where it needs to be, but there's no question that the pendulum is shifting in the right direction. Lauren, you've got any comments on, on this question and just around this space? I mean, I would agree with what you're saying, Kathy, which is I think there's also just more awareness and more desire to bring diversity into those rooms. And so that alone, yeah. I think will be really helpful. I think Jackie's right. I think that there's a lack of relationships there. And, and also in some cases, like, I think just a lack of confidence, right, to really put yourself out there. I think that like that idea of raising yeah capital and seeking funding for your business idea. And there are a lot of great organizations. I was part of one when I was in California, the Women's Startup Lab, and right. it was all about mentoring and coaching female founders on their pitches to VCs. And so I think we're moving in the right direction. We're still far from where we need to be, yeah. but the fact that there's people that are focused and care about it, and also just this awareness of the fact that you know, it's disproportionately that those funds are going to men and a desire, I think, on the VC side and also in other places in the community yep. to shift that pendulum yep. more. No. But it's exciting. And I think more conversations about this are really important because the confidence level is critical to people needing to step in the room and wanting to step in the room to change that. Um, we're on the hour. Unfortunately, I feel like we could do a part two to this in a nanosecond and just keep this going. So we may have to entertain that at some point. And Lauren and Jackie, I'll circle back with you. But we are so appreciative of your voices, your expertise, your thought leadership, your book. I'm just going to shameless plug. I just have to. It's such an extraordinary book, Self-Made Boss. It's fun. You can kind of pick it up anywhere and pick up a nugget. And I love that about the way you wrote it and the way it's edited and laid out. The stories, the information, it is priceless. So I highly recommend that you pick up a copy of it. And while you're at it, I got to say, not, not a bad read either. Reinvent your life. What are you waiting for? I feel like this is the prequel <laughs> to the self-made boss. So I think there's a companion story in our books here together. Um, I want to thank you both so much for your time today in your incredibly busy and wonderful lives. And thank you for the conversation and the participation. Thank you, everybody. So, Janya, I'm so sorry that we didn't get to your question. If you want to email me, um, happy to sort of connect you and make sure that we address it. And I thank you for being here. Um, That's great. And we're both on Twitter. I'm at Jackie Rhesus and Lauren is Weinberg Lauren. <laughs> so you can easily find us. Perfect. Yeah. And if, Awesome. If you, if you didn't grab that, just let me know. Thank you all. Have a wonderful, wonderful rest of the month until we're back on the next Tuesday with Mara Siegel on July 7th, I think it is. Um, we will have an incredible session with her. Happy reinventing everybody. 